All right, my name is Frank, and I'm one of the pastors, and there's probably about a 40% chance that I'm going to have vertigo during this sermon, so loud noises tend to trigger it, so don't freak out if I freak out. Um, In any event, um, a couple things I want to start with. We're in a series, um, and we have this church where we believe truth is really important, Um, and we're going to talk about that again today because we're going to talk about the challenge that was facing the first century church. And the challenge, honestly, that's facing our church, and that is that there are false teachers who struggle and come into the church for the purpose of destroying the message of Jesus. Thank you. Fall back in six o'clock. Got it. Okay. Now, before we start, I need to make a correction from last week's sermon, um, which I always hate to do, but um, last week, uh, it's more of an omission than it is a correction. I, I said that I wanted to believe that Jesus has a name for each of us that speaks to our potential, that, that just like he renamed Peter the Rock and he renamed James and John the Sons of Thunder, I, I want him to have a name for me. So when I get to heaven, he goes, hey, here's your name. And I said, you know, I don't know that I can support that in Scripture. And it must have been the vertigo talking because I knew I could support it in Scripture. So let me show you the Scripture. He who has an ear, let him hear. Let me show you the scripture. He who has an ear, (laughs) let him hear. Trust me, it's in there. There it is. What the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. So praise God, we're all going to get new names. Uh, So that's the correction from last week. We're in a series, and for those of you that are new, welcome to Remnant, I'm glad you're here. Um, We're in a series, and sometimes you can can get lost in the nomenclature of a series, so I want to make sure that when I use words, you know what those words mean, okay? So the struggle with the early church towards the end of the first century, as the apostles were dying off, was that people were coming into the church, claiming to be apostles, claiming to teach something, but it wasn't true. And that teaching became known as Gnosticism. And Gnosticism basically had two premises. One, Jesus is totally unnecessary because your life is not about your sin, forgiveness, him on the cross, him resurrected. Uh, Really, salvation is based on having special knowledge. That Jesus was never human, that he never really died on the cross, that he never really resurrected. It doesn't matter because you didn't need him anyway. That's what the Gnostics would teach. In addition to that, they would say he's never coming back. And the way you find salvation is to get special knowledge that somebody else has, that only a few people have. Well, Peter's facing this as they're coming into the church. And he begins to realize, I'm on death row. In fact, I'll likely die in the next week or two. I better write down some stuff and tell people what they need to know. And so he wrote down second, what we call Second Peter. And that's the book that we're studying. And I want you to think today about Have you ever watched those shows? I love to watch these shows for some reason, where the person goes hiking, they fall in a canyon, nobody knows they're there, the dog goes and finds somebody, brings them back. They're going to die if somebody doesn't help them. There's usually something seriously wrong with them, and then the helicopter shows up, right? And the helicopter shows up, and and it's it's, it's almost like they look up after hours of waiting, wondering if help will ever come, and they're helpless, and they know they're going to die if something doesn't happen. When finally comes, that helicopter seems like it's coming straight out of heaven. I can't imagine what it looks like to look up at one of those helicopters knowing they're coming to save you. That you have no other way to be rescued, and without that help, you're dead. They can't reach them by foot, so they send a rescue helicopter. Think about that. After hours of waiting, hours of wondering if help would ever come, knowing you're going to die if you're not rescued... And then finally, as if somebody straight from heaven comes down, hovers above you and pulls you out of that circumstance. It's amazing. I think about the rope, that lifeline that comes down. I have this thing about heights for obvious reasons. Uh, I don't do real well on flat ground. So uh, the idea of being on a ledge or being next to something is like, no, it's not good for me. Uh, But I know if I was ever in that situation... And that lifeline came down to me. 
I would hold on to that rope with everything I had. I wouldn't be nonchalant about it. I would be strangling that rope to death because that is my lifeline. If I let go of that, I'm done. If I don't hold on, I have no connection to the power that's going to rescue me. My only connection to get out is not the helicopter coming. It's not the lifeline coming down. The only way I get out of this circumstance and save my life is to hold on to that lifeline no matter what happens. Without a connection to that, there's nothing. That, that line is it's, it's a lifeline. That's why they call it that. Peter's offering a lifeline to the people who are facing false teaching in the early church. Last week we started with 2 Peter. Well, we sort of started with 2 Peter. We got two words into it. Um, the series Stick to the Path is about the leaders of the early church trying to protect their flock. And it's important to understand that the basis of every false religion, every false teaching in the world today is Gnosticism. If it doesn't involve Jesus at the center of it, it involves some kind of special knowledge, something added to what Jesus did. Doesn't matter if it's Jehovah's Witness, Mormons, Branch Davidians, Oprah Winfrey's Club, the uh, um, uh, New Age, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, you name it, they have taken what Jesus did and said, okay, there's new knowledge on top of that that's the real truth. So this isn't just a battle for the early church. It's a battle for the church today. If you haven't watched this series, I want to encourage you to go online and catch up. Uh, you can fast forward through some of the sermon and get to the big points at the end. It's really good, uh, and I really want you to stay ahead of where we're at. Now, we learned last week there can be a lot in somebody's name. Simeon Peter. And many came up to me and they said, you know, usually I skip over the introduction of these letters. I go to where the big stuff starts. I skip over that grace and peace to you and everybody you've ever known and blah, blah, blah. Skip right over it. I want to encourage you not to do that. Some of the deepest theological truths in the Bible are revealed in the greeting and introduction of the New Testament letters. The things that we breeze through, that we read past, they cover so much ground and they set up the tone for the letter and they help you understand who's going to write the letter. And we've been talking about that. Today we're going to go all the way down to verse 4. <laughs> hey, it's not word 4, it's verse 4. It seems like they're inconsequential. Peter begins, however, to unpack some really serious truth. And if we breeze by them, we're going to miss it. Let me read it to you. It won't be on the screens. I want to read the first four verses to you, and then we're going to go back and unpack them. But I want you to hear it the way the church would have heard it. They didn't have the Bible. They didn't have books. They didn't have printouts. They didn't have PowerPoint slides. They simply had a letter that was delivered to the church, and the leader of the church would read the letter to them. Okay? So let's start. Simeon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted us things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us precious and great promises, so that through them you can be partakers of a divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. That's what we're going to unpack. Peter, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. We see Peter use four words to introduce himself. Simeon, Peter, servant, apostle. In that order, for that reason. More literally, I am Simon Peter, a slave of Jesus Christ. And an apostle of Jesus Christ. Last week we talked about how you can't know Peter unless you realize he was first Simon. That Simon Peter reflects both his fallen name and the name Jesus gave him. He also wants you to know, don't you dare call me an apostle unless you realize I'm a slave of Jesus first. The word in the Bible, slave and servant, are the same. We'll get into that in a minute. 
Slavery was prevalent in the ancient world. The economy of Egypt, Greece, Rome was based on slave labor. In the, Chris, in the first Christian century, one out of every three people in Italy and one out of five people everywhere else was a slave. Huge gangs toiled in the fields and mines and on building projects. Some slaves were domestic and civil servants. Some were temple slaves. Some were craftsmen. Some were highly intelligent, held responsible positions. Legally, a slave had no rights. And except for those that were in the gangs, most were treated humanely, and many were set free as free persons. Domestics were usually considered part of the family, and some were greatly loved by their masters. A person could become a slave as a result of being captured in war, defaulting on a debt, the inability to support themselves, and voluntarily selling themselves into slavery, being sold as a child by destitute parents, being born to slave parents, conviction of a crime, kidnapping, piracy. Slavery was prevalent, and it cut across all races, all nationalities, all cultures. It had nothing to do with what race you were. It was more, if anything, a financial slavery. It was a way for people who were in debt to basically sell themselves and have a place to live while they worked. The only difference was they couldn't not work, and they couldn't not show up to work, and they technically couldn't leave. In the time of the New Testament, a bondservant referred to a person who was in the permanent role of service. A bondservant was considered the property of a Roman citizen. They had no right to leave that place of service. Sometimes a slave could purchase their freedom. That's why it's called a bond. They pay the bond and they're free. Other times their servant leader, their master, would free them. By the early first century church, there actually became a synagogue of these freed men who set up a church of Jesus Christ. So these were people that previously had been uh, in uh, slavery. They had bought their freedom or had been given their freedom, and they began to worship Jesus Christ. And we read about it in Acts chapter 6. This won't be up on your screen, but I'll just read it to you real quickly. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and the Cyrenians and the Alexandrians and those from Sicily and from Asia rose up and disputed with Stephen. The synagogue of freed men, a group of people who'd come together and formed a church. Now, Paul and Peter insisted that Christian slaves were to be obedient to their masters and not seek freedom just because they'd been converted. That was a key question. I was a slave in bondage to my sin and I was a slave now I have been freed from my sin, am I still a slave? Should I still submit to my master? Okay. Now here's the deal. As we talk about this, you've got to take out your cultural awareness of what happened in the 1840s and beyond in the South. That type of slavery is not what we're talking about. Most of us, when we hear the word master, we recoil, right? Because of what we've seen and what we've understood about something that's gone horribly wrong. Paul claimed... Uh, several things. One was masters had to be kind, they had to represent Jesus, and they had to treat their slaves very well. Or if you prefer the word servant, very well. Slave trading was absolutely condemned. You couldn't sell another human being. And Paul claimed that in Christ, human status was unimportant. In other words, the most important thing is whether or not you know Jesus. It doesn't matter whether you're a slave, whether you're a master, no matter what you are, the most important thing in your life is that you know Jesus. Now, neither Jesus nor the apostles ever condemned slavery in Scripture. That was a problem for us in the early part of our nation. Slavery was so much a part of their culture in the first century that neither Jesus or the apostles set forth anything about slavery except they promoted human dignity and equality, and it was the teachings of Jesus that initially led to abolition in these countries. Okay, in other words, they didn't attack slavery in general. What they said was, look, slavery in our culture in many ways is a way of helping people get back on their feet and pay for things. But here's the deal. They have as much value as you have. If you're their master, you should be serving them. They shouldn't be traded. They should be treated with dignity. They should be treated the way Jesus tells you to treat people. In our nation's history, and many of you know that I'm a Civil War buff, 
particularly a, 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 I study the sermons that were going on in the North and South at the time leading up to the war and during the war. Incredible to me. How people of God could ignore God's word for their own purposes, preach things to other people, and lead the masses to destroy each other. The real challenge in the Civil War was that the pastors of the South used scripture and used sermons about slavery to both enslave people, to treat them poorly, and to encourage those who were doing it, when what they were doing was going directly against the Word of God. In fact, there's a lot of studies, I go on this for hours, that show that it was the preaching from the pulpit that set the tone for the conflict of the Civil War. That had the Southern preachers taught the Word of God, slavery would have been abolished without any fighting, without anything else. Interesting story, I'll probably go on forever. Okay. Now, in their culture, there was nothing worse than to be a slave. It meant you were poor, it meant you sold yourself out, it meant you couldn't make it or you were in prison or whatever. From their perspective, the worst thing you could be is a slave. Much like our culture today. Submission, not succeeding, homeless, all those kind of things, not real good. Yet for thousands of years, this is very interesting, for thousands of years, the Jewish people used the term servant, bond servant or slave to describe their relationship with God. In other words, they took what the world says was the worst thing and they made it the very best thing as they related to their God. In Israel, the idea emerged that a great privilege was to be a servant or slave of God. He is my master. I'm surrendered to him. He decides everything. The slavery that the Jews depicted was a voluntary act of surrender. I give up everything I am, everything I have, everything I ever will be. Without coercion, I'm going to surrender myself to the purposes of Jesus Christ. I'm going to fully get rid of myself. I'm his servant. I'm his follower. I'm his slave. You did this because you wanted to. Every time in the Bible where you see the word servant, it's the same word as slave. In the Old Testament, Abraham, Moses, David, and the prophets were all referred to as servants or slaves of God. The prophet Isaiah, when talking about the Messiah, said he would be the ultimate servant slave. Isaiah 42.1, behold my servant or my slave who I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. God speaking about Jesus. Later on in Isaiah, Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up. He shall be exalted. My slave will be exalted. My servant will be exalted. It's so countercultural to the world and the way the world looks at things. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them, they see. That which they have not heard, they understand. When Jesus came, he placed his highest emphasis on being the lowest servant possible in the room. Everywhere he went, we were to be servants. We are slaves of Jesus. We're to do what he does. Mark 10, 44, and whoever would be first among you must be the slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom, there's the bond, for many. What Jesus is saying is, look, I'm a slave of the Father. I am the Father. I'm a slave of the Father. I'm God. I've come here. I've submitted myself to be the lowest human form possible. Okay, I was born in a manger. I died on a cross. I was cursed on a tree. You can't get any lower than I am. And oh, by the way, I'm washing your feet. You see, I'm a slave. I'll do whatever the Father asks me to do. And if you're my follower, I want you to do the same thing. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. In other words, you can walk around all day till the cows come home, and you can say, you know what? Yeah, I'm the same as as the people that work for me. I'm the same as people that serve me. I'm the same. But if you don't do it, treat them like that, you're not following what Jesus has told you to do. 
Luke 17, 10. So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. In other words, never pride up in the service of Jesus Christ. The most prideful thing you can say as a follower of Christ is I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. It says everything anybody needs to know about you. In Scripture, Paul, James, Peter, and Jude all refer to themselves as slaves of Jesus. So when Peter says, I'm a slave of Jesus, he's simply stating what others who have followed Jesus, what the prophets have said for years, and what Jesus himself said about himself. Peter said, don't forget that I'm Simon. Don't forget that Jesus made me Peter. Don't forget that I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. And then and only then when you understand those three things can you even think about calling me an apostle. I'm a servant of Jesus. In other words, Peter's saying, I'm just like you. We're all obedient slaves of Christ. Every greeting in every New Testament letter has an inclusiveness to it, a reminder of what brings us all together. That's why you'll always see the name Jesus Christ many times in the first three lines of every letter. They're reminding the audience what, ha what we have in common is our relationship and the fact that we're all slaves of Jesus. We're all here to serve him. If you went into this room and said, okay, what's the chances that all these people would be together in this moment if it wasn't Jesus, we probably never would have met each other. He's the reason we're here. He's the reason that we all come here. It's who we worship. It's who we serve. It's who we surrender our lives to. And people don't understand this coming to Jesus thing is not about knowledge. It's about having knowledge and acting on it. It's about surrendering everything you have will be to Jesus Christ and then reminding everybody that's why we're all here. Peter says, look, don't forget that I'm Simeon. Don't forget that I'm a servant of Jesus. Now remember why Peter is identifying himself. He's going to challenge the false teaching. Remember the Gnostics that are coming into the church? That's what this letter is about. So we're a few words into it. And this is a letter of authority. Peter's writing his last letter to the church, knowing that false teachers are coming in behind him. They're going to call themselves apostles. They're going to bring false teaching. They're going to say that Jesus didn't matter. And he's writing his next letter, the last letter, you would think he would start out with a list of his credentials. I mean, if I was writing a letter to you guys about a challenge coming into the church, there's a flesh part of me that would go, hey, look, I've got a degree in this. I've watched this happen to other churches. I've done whatever. My, my impulse would be to tell you why you should listen to me. You would expect Peter to say, look, I'm Peter. I walked on the water. I heal lame people. I'm the leader of the biggest Christian church in Jerusalem. I studied at the school of Jesus at his feet every day and night for three straight years. I know him as well as anybody. He named me the rock because I hold on to truth. I was in his inner circle. I've seen it all, the transfiguration, the crucifixion. I was the first disciple he came to when Jesus resurrected. I'm an authority on the topic and life of Jesus Christ. You should listen to me, and this is what I'm going to tell you. That's what you would expect him to say. In our Western culture, that's how it's done. If I want you to believe something, I got to tell you why I'm an expert. And if I tell you I'm an expert, I better bring it. That's our culture. That's actually what Peter does. He takes all those words that we just read and he condenses them into something a little bit easier. Hi, I'm Simeon. I became Peter and I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. There's no greater words anybody can say about themselves than I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. This is who I was. This is who Jesus made me into. And now I've become his slave. The world can call me whatever they want to call me. They can give me whatever title, whatever they want, doesn't matter. What you need to know is I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. And that's what Peter's telling them. So now that you know about me, Peter says, I'm a slave, but I'm also an apostle of Jesus Christ. Not a title I gave myself, one that was given to me by Jesus himself. Luke 6, 13, and when the day came, he called his disciples and chose from them 12 whom he named apostles. Jesus himself gave the 12 disciples, and this is going to be important, 
the title, the office, the position of being an apostle. Okay? It's going to be important because we're going to distinguish that between the gift of apostleship. Okay? These 12 people were given the title by Jesus of apostle. If you want to think about it, apostle with a capital A. Okay? Peter was one of them. Two others would be given that title. After Judas falls, Matthias would be given that title, and Paul himself would be given that title. Apostle comes from the Greek word apostolos. It refers to a person who's an envoy or a representative of their master, of Jesus. And they usually have authoritative roles. So an apostle is somebody that the master has selected to represent him to other people. Okay? Last week we talked about living stones in the house of God. Remember that? How we talked about how there's a cornerstone that's Jesus and all of us are part of the living stones. Remember on the wall? I saved part of that story for today. You see, because in place long before we were ever part of that living wall was the foundation of the house of God. And the foundation is made up of the prophets and the apostles. Let me read it to you. So then you are no longer strangers or aliens, but you are fellow citizens with saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Okay, so what this says is, look, there's a cornerstone, it's Jesus. It was prophesied years ago, he's perfect, everything aligns with him. But what they're also telling you is the 12 apostles form the foundation of this church. They were commissioned not only to proclaim the good news, but to develop and guarantee that the truth of the gospel message made the foundation of the church. In other words, the 12 apostles' responsibility above all else was to protect the truth. You were there. You saw him. You know what happened. You know he was human. You know he was real. You know he died on the cross. You know he resurrected. You are the foundation of the church I'm building. Jesus is the cornerstone. The apostles, the prophets, they're the foundation of truth. And every one of us is weaved into that wall as a living stone. And the purpose of the whole thing is to be the house of God and be built by the Spirit to house God himself. We are the temple of God, the church as a whole. The 12 apostles knew Jesus. They encountered him face to face. And they received this title from Jesus himself. They are apostles because Jesus said they were. The qualifications of apostles were identified when they had to choose Matthias. Only two men were identified as potential replacements for Judas. No women were chosen, even though Jesus' mother, Mary, was present at the, serve, at the time. The criteria for selecting the apostle was, one, the man must have been a witness of Christ from baptism to ascension, and two, that it was God's will that men be an apostle, okay? So when they looked at this, one of the things we should notice is when it talks about the office of apostle in scripture, it's always past tense, okay? We will see in 2 Peter and in Jude, the 12 are referred to in the past tense. There will be no more who carry the office of apostle. Okay, the apostles are done. They are the foundation of the church, all 12 of them, 14 really. And their job is to protect the truth. Okay? If the apostles existed today, they could write new books. They could write new scripture. The Bible would keep getting bigger and bigger. And that's exactly what the Gnostics wanted to do. I'm an apostle. You have to listen to what I say. And oh, by the way, here's my book of Mormon. Here's my book of Jehovah's Witness. Here's my book of Islam. You need to listen to me because I'm an apostle and I've got the answers now. But when you read scripture, the apostles had once and for all the truth delivered to them that they delivered to us that formed the foundation of the church of Jesus. Ephesians 2.20 teaches that the church was established on the apostles and the prophets, but notice three words having been built. That's the, what we call the aorist tense, and it refers to a completed action. The foundation of the church has already been built. It is done. 
The truth has been revealed. There's no new truth coming. It's been sealed by the apostles. It's been validated by eyewitnesses. It is the foundation of the church, the truth of God. Nothing's going to be added to it. No new teaching's going to come in. And for Peter's purposes, no new special knowledge exists. If the apostles didn't know it, didn't protect it, didn't guard it, and didn't validate it, it has nothing to do with the church of Jesus Christ. Okay? So we have to stop here and address an obvious question. Don't some people call themselves apostles today? The answer is yes. One of the spiritual gifts listed in the Bible is that of apostleship. It's not the office, capital A, of apostle. It is apostleship. It is, in a sense, someone who's been called by God to be a messenger, gifted by God to be a messenger of God's truth, an apostleship. Ephesians 4.11, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ. Okay? That A is not about the office of apostle, it's about the spiritual gift of apostleship. Okay? There are people who've been given that gift. They're going to take the already established, completed message of Jesus Christ out to the world. Today we would call them missionaries or church planters, people who have a desire not to add to the truth, but to build on the foundation of truth that the true apostles held, okay? Barnabas, Silas, others in Scripture were told to have this gift. Now, I believe, I understand about the gift of apostleship, okay? And I'm not arguing that at all. But I would never in my greatest moment of self-delusion ever refer to myself or let anybody else refer to me as an apostle. I could take on that title no more than I could take on the title of Messiah or Christ. It's just not a title I think I want to have. To imply or even hint to somebody that I have the same office designated by Jesus that he gave to Peter and his disciples is dangerously absurd. But these people say, well, look, we're not claiming to be an apostle. We're claiming to be an apostle with apostleship. I say, I totally get it. You're gifted as an apostle through apostleship. You're not saying you're one of the 12. But to know that in the church such confusion exists, that when you say, I'm apostle so-and-so, that some people are going to not understand what that means. They're not going to understand the difference between somebody who has a gift of church planning and somebody who Jesus claimed was one of his apostles. And what happens is when you begin to call yourself an apostle, there will be people who will think, oh, then you speak for God, just like Peter did. What you say is true, just like what Peter said. They don't understand the difference. So for me, to use that term in any way to define yourself is somewhat of a pride ride. And it discounts in my mind their teaching on other topics. It just makes me pause. What in the world are you doing? Why is this so important? Because in Peter's world and in our world, false teachers, Gnostics, are going to come into the church. And they're going to try to use the same title Peter used. And they're not going to teach the truth. They're going to add to the foundation. They're going to skip over the humble servant part, and they're going to go right to call me the apostle part. The internet is full of people defending why they should be allowed to be called apostle. And it breaks my heart. I'm not saying that you don't have the gift, but there's a humble servant part that goes with this. And Peter actually had the title and used the humble servant part. It was enough to know he was a slave of Christ. In the church today, sadly, being called an apostle is a lot like Seinfeld and Maestro. (laughs) And if you watch Seinfeld, you'll know what I'm talking about. The first test of a true teacher is to not do anything that brings confusion or misunderstanding to those you're entrusted to teach. If you know that there's confusion about the term apostle in the Bible and that people, anybody, could be misled to think you're claiming the same status as the, as the true apostles, then don't use it. Don't deceive, don't, don't confuse people. It'd be better to be known as a missionary than to falsely imply you carry the office of apostle, even if you know what you're talking about. 
The best, highest title any of us can ascribe to in the church is to be a slave of Jesus Christ. That's it. You want the highest title? You're a slave of Jesus Christ. If other people want to call you a pastor, you're a slave of Jesus Christ. If other people want to call you a, a worship leader, a musician, a, a servant, whatever, you're a slave of Jesus Christ. That's the important thing. The title the world gives you, the position you hold, the spiritual gift you have is not that important. I see churches getting ripped apart on spiritual gifts and who has what and who's this and who's it. Forget it. You're a slave of Jesus Christ. That's the important thing. Simeon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. This was crazy for the audience. We read it and we go, oh, yeah, okay, cool. Next line, what's next? Let's get to something good. Do you remember when we talked about how important it is to remember who's writing? And how we spoke in week two that Peter had unique experiences that God allowed in his life to prepare him to minister to others? This is one of those moments. No one on earth could be better prepared to tell this Gentile audience on the topic that he's addressing. Remember, he's writing to the church to try to keep them from Gnosticism, from false teaching. Peter tells the Gentiles that they have the same faith as he or anyone else has. So make sure you understand this. Jewish people for years thought they were the chosen ones, right? Now we're towards the end of the first century. The Gentiles have all been brought in. Peter looks at them as an apostle, as a servant, slave of Jesus Christ, and says, you have the same faith I have. You didn't get a watered down faith. Just because you're not Jewish doesn't mean you don't have the same faith I have. Okay, now why is that so important coming from Peter? Remember, it was Peter who validated that they should receive the gift in the first place. Remember that God sent Peter a vision. Do you remember that? God sent Peter a vision to help him understand that Gentiles should not be excluded. And God used Peter to bring the faith of the first Gentile convert. It was Peter with impeccable Jewish credentials who spoke out decisively in allowing Gentiles to enter the new covenant on the basis of faith alone. We can better appreciate the phrase to those who have received a faith as precious as ours when we hear the echoes of the struggle in the background. Acts 15, 7. And after there had been much debate, guess who stood up? Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And now Peter is turning to those very people towards the end of his life, and he's saying, you have the same faith that I have. You have the same gift that I have. You have the same promise that I have. You have the same truth that I have. Because the Gnostics were coming into the church saying, you're not Jewish. Why would a Jewish God save you? This is just, they're trying to get your money. And Peter's like, no, no, you don't understand. I, better than anybody, understand that the message is for the Gentiles as well. Then note... There are interesting doctrinal truths. We have received this as a gift, he says. Not earned, given. Given to everybody equally, and we all get the same gift. The same faith I received, Peter says, as an apostle, as a slave of Jesus, is the same faith you received. I don't have more of it. I don't have less of it. It's exactly the same. The gift is for all of us. We all have the same faith. And after Peter defines who he is, he needs to make sure his audience knows who they are. He is going to establish their foundation. They all have the same gift of salvation and they've all been given one truth. And notice that his words are past tense. You've already been given. You've already obtained it. You don't grow into it. You don't earn it. It was past tense already given to you. You receive the same faith that was given to Peter, James, John, Matthew, and any other believer you can name. It is of equal standing. It is the same. The Greek word is a balance, like a chemistry balance. My faith, your faith. Right? Peter's faith, your faith. Matthew's faith, your faith. Same faith. 
And it's past tense. It was given to you at your salvation. You've received the entire truth, all of it. Nothing has to be added to it. Nothing will be added to it. There will never be a special knowledge that you weren't given originally. You may learn about the truth of Jesus. You may learn more and more and grow in that truth. And hopefully you do, Peter will say. But no new truth is ever coming. Your understanding of the presented truth is what we're focusing on. When he says this, he's basically saying, to you who have received the teachings about Jesus Christ or to you whom God has caused to trust in Jesus Christ. That's who he's talking to. How did we get this incredible gift? Well, he says, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, righteousness usually refers to when God puts a sinner in a right relationship with him. Here's what's interesting about this phrase. This is the only place in the Bible where we read by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Everywhere else in the Bible, when it talks about righteousness, it's the righteousness of God. This one time, Peter says, righteousness of Jesus Christ. Why is that important? Because Peter is going to make the, the point over and over in this book, as often as he can, that Jesus is God. Because the Gnostics are going to deny that. So you'll see in this letter, over and over, Peter attributing to Jesus everything about God. And so when he says the righteousness of, everybody would have almost filled in the blank God. And instead he says the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Peter, not three verses in, is already hitting one of the key points of this letter. He will repeat it over and over. Jesus is God. He's fully God. He's fully man. We got this righteousness from our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The whole tenor of the letter from beginning to end puts Jesus in the same balance with the Father. They are the same. They are one and the same. Jesus was God, became man, walked on the planet. He's fully God. Remember, the Gnostics are going to say he was just some spirit. He never became human, right? So he's already establishing that. Then he says, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, letters were rare back then. We don't always think about that, but it took a lot of work to write a letter. It took forever to get it somewhere. And when you got one, it was really special. The style was always to identify yourself, identify who you're writing to, tell them what you want to tell them, and then give them some encouragement at the end. That's the style of almost every letter of the time. Now, here's the interesting thing. Romans and Greeks often greeted each other by saying Shireen. Okay, C-H-A-R-E-I-N. It literally means howdy. Well, not really. That's Texan. <laughs> it simply means greetings. So when a Greek person would come to another Greek person, shereen. All right? And they would go, that sounds more Hebrew, doesn't it? Shereen, I guess. Okay? And that just meant greetings. How are you? Okay? The Jewish people of the day said something very different. They said shalom, peace. When they met somebody, peace. And what it really meant, may the peace of God be upon you, both as we meet, and then when you leave, they're going to say it again, okay? So it's very common in the day for people to greet each other with, in a Greco-Roman audience, either shalom or sharin, okay? Now, how you greeted somebody identified who you were, whether you were Greek, whether you were Jewish, okay? Christians in the first century had their own way of greeting one another because it wasn't always safe to greet each other. Right? During certain part, remember Nero's burning Christians. They took that word of Greek, Sharon, and they changed it to literally the word Sharis, which means grace. Okay? So when they met somebody, they would say, if they were Christian, grace and peace to you. You see it throughout the Bible, right? You see it in almost every letter. First and second Corinthians, first and second uh, something. Um, I'll think of it. Timothy. Um, first James, I talked about a few weeks ago. Somebody corrected me on There is only one James, but technically first James is the first James. So in any event, okay, they all start off with grace and peace to you. What they're saying is Sharice uh, and Shalom. In other words, I'm telling you I'm a Christian. Okay? It's similar to the holidays here in the U.S. Merry Christmas. Okay, you know if somebody goes out of their way to say Merry Christmas, 
They're telling you I believe in Jesus Christ, for the most part. If they say happy holidays, they're telling you I don't. Same sort of thing. Paul in 1 Corinthians, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy, to Timothy, my true child on the face, grace, mercy, and peace from God and the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. To Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. So when they write a letter, almost always grace and peace begin the letter. Peter, in our book today, will say, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Hmm. Instead of greetings, they change the name of the greeting. But Peter does something unusual now. He doesn't say grace and peace. He says, may your grace and peace be multiplied in the knowledge. Wow, that's different. In the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. He does several things there. You have grace and peace from God. Not only do I want you to have it, I want it multiplied. Do you know how it gets multiplied? It gets multiplied through knowledge. The more truth you know, the more grace and peace you know. Okay? And what is it the knowledge of? God and Jesus Christ our Lord. God and Jesus Christ our Lord, equally balanced. Once again, he's claiming Jesus is God. People say all the time, the Bible doesn't say Jesus. It says it all the way through it. You just don't know how to read it. So, in the knowledge, so Peter not only gives them a blessing, he tells them where the blessing comes from. Knowledge. And that's going to be a recurrent theme in this book. Everything points and comes to from Jesus, who's God, and knowledge of him, both relationally and intellectually, is the key to receiving it. Remember, this entire letter is a letter to fight false knowledge, false truth from imposters. The only way you're going to offset that false truth is to know the real truth yourself. The problem with Gnostics is not that they had knowledge. The problem is they think they have special knowledge. And the knowledge they do have is based on lies. So Peter opens and closes this letter with a reference to the knowledge of God and Christ. So as we read 2 Peter, we have to have a clear understanding of knowledge. Peter will tell us there's knowledge of truth that every believer must know for themselves. But there's also knowledge that comes from a relationship. What I mean by that is Peter's saying, look, the most important thing is that you have knowledge of Christ. But I'm not talking about just what you know about Christ in your head. I'm talking about that you have experiential knowledge of Jesus Christ in your life. That you've walked with him. That you've prayed to him. That you've been in his word. That you've studied everything about him. That your every moment of every day, everything you're thinking about is how do I obtain more of Jesus? How do I understand more? How do I walk more? How do I surrender more? How do I step out in faith more? You see, because I want the peace and abundance that God offers me in full. I want it complete. I want every bit of it. I want it to multiply in my life. Tell me, Peter, please, how do I get more of that in my life? Well, Jesus left his truth, the written word about him that came from these very apostles who were to guard the truth. You'll never experience the life Jesus has planned for you if you're not in the Word. It's your lifeline. We know this, right? I mean, the people I know who are most peace-filled and grace-filled believers, they have a Bible that is worn out. The pages are ruffled. It's, it's, the leather's worn out from the hands that have been holding it, sometimes strangling it, trying to find Jesus, trying to hold on during tough times. Many of you probably know that I like to collect Bibles. Um, I have Bibles dating back to the 1700s, and I love to open them up because that Bible was opened up 200 years ago, people looking for the same truth. I've got Bibles that are this thick, printed like 200 and something years ago. It's incredible. The words haven't changed, by the way. They're all King James, just so you know. You don't find an NIV from 1860. But the truth is, is that it's God's Word, and it hasn't changed. And the same word people turn to 
in the early 1300s is the same word we turn to now. And there is a truth that was handed down that has never changed. It is true. You're not to add to it. You're not to take away from it. No special knowledge. And we're reborn a baby in the faith, and we have this potential. So many people walk through church trying to fake peace. And the reason they don't have it is they're not really spending time with Jesus. They surrendered, yeah. They go to church, they serve, they tithe, they do all that sort of stuff. But if you look at their day, that dusty, incredible lifeline over there, they're not touching at all. They'll just wait for somebody else to tell them what's in it. We're worried and taught in our culture the danger of sterile faith, of head knowledge without any heart knowledge, right? We all have heard that. We need to be equally careful about heart knowledge that never touches the head. Oh, well, when I think of Jesus, I get warm and fuzzy. Jesus, he's my savior, and I have a relationship with him. Okay, are you reading his word? No. Are you studying? No, no, it's just good that I feel good. Say, I feel good. Well, are you being transformed? Are you being changed? Are you connected to him in his word? I agree the helicopter's pretty, but are you holding on to the lifeline? Well, I'm just glad he's here. I don't, you know, other people hold on to that line for me. I just feel good knowing he's up there. That's not what he called us to be. Disciples of Jesus know everything they can know about Jesus. They're constantly studying, constantly learning, constantly surrendering. They are slaves to Jesus Christ. They do what the master wants them to do. They have to know the master. They have to know everything about him, what he thinks, what he teaches, what he is. They have to be, well, in Christ. That's what they have to be. Everything about them has to be focused on Jesus Christ. Knowing him doesn't refer to some casual acquaintance. It means exact, complete thorough knowledge of everything about him, his history, his essence, and who he is. Peter tells them and us, the more you know Jesus personally and intellectually, the more you'll experience his grace and peace. In fact, Peter says, it'll be multiplied in your life. It doesn't mean having warm, fuzzy feelings. You do have that, but it also means understanding who he is with every implication. We come to a knowledge of him. We learn through his word. We learn through prayer. We learn through the community of God's people. And yet, in our culture and in churches, we're willing to try to do anything except obtain knowledge of him. We want a shortcut. Tell me I can just serve. Tell me I can just feel bad about my sins. We need to come to the same place that the Apostle Paul did. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of many things and count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ. Paul says, look, knowing him is everything. Everything else in life is trash. Unworthy of my time, my energies, my efforts. I know Christ. I got to learn everything about him. I got to understand who he is. I got to know why he came. I need to know where he is. I need to know that he's coming back. I need to understand salvation and surrender and forgiveness and repentance and rebirth. I need to study the scriptures. I need to memorize scripture. I need to have it on my tongue when Satan starts to fight with me. I have to know him and not just in my head. I've got to embrace him in every way possible. In other words, Paul says, I got to know Christ my Lord that I may gain Christ. He has to be everything because without him, everything else is rubbish. Hmm. His divine power has granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to glory and excellent. Peter continues and he says, look, Everything you have in your life comes from a divine power. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead. The same power that spoke everything into creation. The same power that set the stars up in the skies and arranged the planets. The same power that's holding it all together right now in this moment. That power has been given to us and gives us everything we'll ever need. He says, you will have the possession of life and it will be expressed in godliness. That order is really important. You can't express a life of godliness if you don't have the life in you, right? So how do we obtain everything we need? Well, there's that word again, knowledge. Specifically, the knowledge of Jesus. Jesus has provided us with a spiritual ability to know him. 
And then it says, and he's called us into his glory and his excellence. In other words, we don't think about this very much. But, but we're promised the same glory, the same excellence that Jesus himself has. Crazy. I mean, it it's, blows your mind when you think about it. The knowledge. So, through his own power, Jesus has given everything we need to live as Christians really should. It's possible because we know God. He's called us to be part of his greatness and his goodness. And then he continues, by which he has granted to us his precious and great promises so that through them you can become partakers of divine nature having escaped the corruption in the world. God has granted to us precious promises. Those promises are the truth of scripture and they've been handed to you and me. And he tells us, these promises are for you too. They're not just Jewish promises. You have the same faith, the same divine power, and you have the same promise in your life that I have in mine. And that promise is that we will share in his divine nature one day and we'll escape the corruption of sin that's holding us back in the world. That's the promise. We don't talk about this much, but God could have just saved us from hell and never offered to take us to heaven. Have you ever thought about that? He could have just said, you know what? Uh, you had a thing you did. I'm going to save you from that. I'm going to die on a cross. If you believe in me, you can have eternal life here. But you're not going to be in heaven with me. You just have eternal life. I'll be your savior. But God says, no, you don't understand. I love you. I can't imagine eternity without you being there. I'm going to rescue you, save you, and then I'm going through my divine power, I'm going to take you to a place in heaven that you'll never experience before. I want you to share my divine nature that I have. That's the promise that's precious and great. So how do we experience this? He says, well, you'll experience it when you escape the corruption of the world. You see, you're in a sinful world and I've sent down to rescue you. I'm going to drop a lifeline to you. And when you grab onto that lifeline with everything you have, then and only then will you be pulled from the weight of the oppression of sin in your life, and I will take you to a new place, a divine place, a place where you can be sharing with me my nature. Every path in our life leads to a destination. Sometimes, like the prodigal son, we just got to come to our senses. Most of us know what it's like to have wandered into a valley we can't get out of, to dig a deeper and deeper hole. And the harder we try to get ourselves out, we just can't get out. And we know we're going to die where we are if somebody doesn't come save us, if somebody doesn't come rescue us, we are done. And spiritually, we know that that help has to come from above. It can't come from anybody on earth because they're just as messed up as we are. No matter how hard we try to help ourselves, we just keep going deeper and deeper. And finally, we get resigned to our fate. If somebody doesn't save me, I'm going to die down here in this mess. And just like the helicopter we talked about earlier, as if it comes from heaven, Jesus says, I'm offering you a lifeline. It cost me my life, but you're worth it. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Translated, I'm your lifeline. I'm what's been sent down from heaven for you to hold on to. If you want to get out of this mess of sin, if you want to turn your life around, if you want to experience my divine power, my divine presence, if you want to get out of this, if you want to be rescued and saved, you better hold on to me with everything you have. Every bit of you needs to hold on to me. My word, my truth, my understanding, my love, my relationship. I got to be all of it for you. You better grab me like that person's holding on to that rope. Because without that, you don't get out of here. You see, the foundation of my truth has been handed down from the apostles. And you have it. People are going to try to dangle all kinds of fancy things in front of you, telling you that they're the way out. But you got to hold on to the truth. So Peter, at the very beginning of this letter, wants believers to know and make sure they know only one thing. What's the most important thing that's going to protect them from Gnosticism? 
What's the most important thing for those he's about to leave behind? In other words, what's the most important thing every believer absolutely has to know? If we know nothing else, we have to know God. We have to know Jesus Christ. Intellectually, experientially, relationally, all-consuming knowledge of Jesus Christ. If you hold on to him with everything you have, the world will not be able to pull you away. Why did God create us? To know him. What aim should we have in life? To know God. What is eternal life? To know God. Jesus, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the one true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. The whole thing is about knowing Jesus. What's the best thing in life bringing more joy and contentment than anything else on earth? To know God. Jeremiah 9, 23, thus says the Lord, let not wise men boast in his wisdom, let not the mighty man boast in his might, let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, righteousness on the earth, for in these things I delight, declares the Lord. God says, what do I delight in? When you realize you know me. What's the most important thing in your life? When you realize you know me. And you know the one I've sent, and I'm the same. Equal balance. You want your lifeline out of here? Know me. You want to get pulled out of the mess that is your sin? Know me. You want to feel divine power? Know me. You want to end up in heaven with my divine nature? Know me. What did God see in man that would bring him the most pleasure? To know God. Hosea 6.6, 6, for I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. I don't want you to do a bunch of stuff for me if you don't know me. I came, created you, built you, and desire that we have a relationship together. This isn't a head thing, it's a heart and head thing. I'm going to send a lifeline down. My promises from the prophets, the word, the letters from Peter and others. You better hold on to those. Because I'm going to pull you out of the mess you're in. But if you're not holding on, you're going to fall to Gnostics. You're going to fall to false teaching. You're going to fall to whatever looks good as it flies by. So do you. Do you know God? Is Jesus everything to you? Are you in his promises in the word? Do you hold on to the truth of scripture no matter what the world says? Do you, do you grasp the truth and you hold on to it? You don't debate it. You don't stand over it and make it say what you want it to say. You surrender to it. You hold on to it because it's your lifeline. And if it changes, you're dead. Because that lifeline is the same foundation that's connected to the cornerstone that our lives are built on. We have to know the truth. When storms come, when the pull of sin shakes our foundation, when we realize we've fallen and we can't get up, do you have a death grip on your lifeline? No matter what the world offers you as a quick solution, are you holding on to what Jesus says? True knowledge of God is always, a, always attended by a fixed belief, a strong, unwavering, unchanging reality that there's trust in God's promises. Today, so many people want a relationship with Jesus and they want to abandon the words of the Bible. You can't do that. It's as if we want God in our own making. Look, I want a relationship with God. I want to feel the warm and fuzzies, but I'm going to rewrite this stuff down here because it's not very good. And I may have to change my life to surrender. You see, because I want to be a slave. I want you to see me as a slave but I want to do what I want to do. I really want to be my own master. Translated, I haven't really surrendered to Jesus. Talked about it, looked good, still doing my own thing. That's the Gnosticism that Peter wants to extinguish. He tells us how to get home. God has come to earth to give us his lifeline, his truth, his message, his way. It's the only thing we can put our trust in. You can almost envision men and women stuck in the mud that is their sin, 
holding on to the Word of God and being lifted out of that to heaven. It's a powerful visual if you think about just the masses of people that could be pulled out of the muck. Almost every time I hear somebody tell me that they're not living in the abundant life that Jesus promised them, that they're going through a valley, that they're not feeling good about things, that they're going through struggles, all those sorts of things, my first question every time, are you abiding in Christ? How much time are you spending praying? How much time are you spending reading the Word? Are you holding on to Him? Because hold on to Him and He'll lift you out of this. But if you're talking to everybody else going around, you're ignoring Him, you're not going to get lifted out of it until you're ready to hold on to Him. One thing Peter wanted to make sure is that those who follow Jesus actually, really, truly know Him and are slaves just like He is. You shall know the truth, and it's the truth that will set you free. Let's pray. God, I thank you for Peter and for the words that you gave him. I thank you for the witness. I thank you, God, that even though we are messed up, neck deep in our own sin, about to die, unable to save ourselves, truly hopeless, that you send that lifeline down to us, and you say, just hold on, I got the rest of this. All you have to do is hold on to me. I'll take you the rest of the way home. God, there are people hearing my voice, both here and online, who need to know that truth. It doesn't matter how deep the valley is, how, how unbelievable it is, how horrible it is, how desperate it seems, how you think that it can't change. God is just a minute away from sending you a rescue line. And all you got to do is cry for help. And just acknowledge that you need to be saved. And that you need to hold on to Jesus because he's the only way. And all the other ways aren't going to get you where you need to go. And to the best of your ability, you just surrender to Christ. Others in this room need to reconnect our grip to that lifeline. We need to fully embrace everything that Jesus is. We need to walk out of this room knowing one thing for sure. I, above all else, no matter what else I accomplish, no matter what else I do, I am a slave of Jesus Christ. Help us, God, to be your slaves, to do your work and to experience the joy that you offer us through the process. We love you, we thank you, and we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.